Greetings to the, all the uh, colleagues and the friends in Budapest and welcome our new friends and colleagues in Beijing and as well as in China. Today we uh, have a seminar titled on the Green Development Action and Policy, European and Chinese Perspectives. And I think this is a very hot topic uh, among the Chinese and the European scholars. And I'm very glad that uh, the China Sea Institute can have the opportunity to cooperate with the uh, Under Yusuf Knowledge Center to initiate, uh, to initiate this uh, seminar. Uh, at the same time, we had received the strong support from the another institution, uh, the Research Institute for Eco Civilization. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And uh, this is uh, 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 personally from the director, uh, Zhang Yongshen. So I'm very thankful for his uh, full support. And because of his uh, strong support, we are very lucky that uh, we can have some very important uh, uh, experts in, in the field in the China. So thanks for the uh, all the uh, colleagues in from China, and also thanks for the strong support as well from the Under UGF Knowledge Center, personally to uh, Chaplaki Jut. And uh, by the way, congratulations to Chaplaki Jut. I, as I heard that uh, you had been appointed to the director of the Under UGF Knowledge Center. So congratulations. And I will, would uh, not like to uh, leave too much uh, words uh, for my opening remarks. And uh, I would like to invite, first of all, uh, Chebrek Ejot to have his uh, welcome speech. Uh, the floor is yours, please, Jot. Thank you very much. Um, so it's a, it's a great honor to organize, uh, to co-organize this um, uh, joint seminar uh, with the China Sea Institute. Um, and I, I fully agree that um, that green transition is a, is a really uh, hot uh, topic, uh, both in China, both in the European Union. Uh, and, it, and this is a very timely seminar since in a month, uh, we are going to have uh, the climate summit in, in Glasgow. So there's no better time to organize this, this seminar uh, than now. Um, and I really don't want to, to spoil my, my presentation uh, about this topic. But really, in, in, from the side of the European Union, uh, the European countries, I think that we are witnessing a transition in terms of how um, the, the European continent is approaching green transition. Um, and I remember five years ago when I started at the Anto Yosef Knowledge Center, we were just organizing a, uh, a conference on green transition and learning from the experiences of, uh, of China. And, um, and when we were um, uh, organizing this conference uh, called Green Tech, um, we, were, we were looking for um, the, the expertise that, that the European countries can learn from China. And I think that, that in the past five years, this, um, this relationship has been mutually beneficial and it's very important to, to continue, uh, especially in the times of, uh, of the pandemic and of, um, of the current global um, arena. Uh, and it's important to, to realize that, especially when we come to the topic of green transition, there is no substitution for international cooperation. No country and no uh, political organization such as the European Union can achieve its goals alone. So international cooperation is, is, is key um, to achieve uh, all the, um, the tasks that we set out to ourselves. And we have very ambitious task, uh, tasks and goals uh, for the upcoming decades. So I'm very honored to, um, to co-organize and to participate in this seminar because we have very important topics to discuss. Um, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chabragi Jot. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, today, at the same time, we are having another uh, very important event we call the High Level Symposium uh, of the uh, Chinese and the CEC think tanks. Uh, it is uh, ongoing at our CAS uh, Congress Hall. 
Uh, so the director of the Institute of European Studies, as well as the president of the China Sea Institute, uh, Professor Feng Zhongping, uh, he is uh, at the moment at the, the other event, so at the uh, symposium. He apologized, he cannot uh, personally to uh, make his uh, welcome remarks, but uh, we can have his uh, uh, video clips on his warm welcoming uh, speech. So I would like to ask uh, my colleague Qi Jiangfei to, uh, to, 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 to bring the <laughs> video clip to us. Please, Mr. Qi. Good morning to our Hungary colleagues and uh, good afternoon to our Chinese colleagues. Um, I'm very happy we are able to uh, bring Chinese expert and Hungarian experts together for today's uh, um, seminar. Um, of course, we, we have done this with our Hungarian uh, colleagues, friends. Uh, I'm most grateful to Mr. Peter et al., Chairman of the et al. Knowledge Center, and Mr. Zolt, yes. Director of the Knowledge Center for their uh, very kind yes, support and yes, uh, yes, yes. close mm -hmm. uh, Let me also take this yeah, opportunity mm -hmm. to Just, uh, say thank you to uh, 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 Professor Zhang Yongsheng, uh, uh, who is the director of um, Institute for Eco uh, Civilization, um, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, Professor Zhang um, uh, kindly recommend uh, uh, Professor Zhang Haibing of Peking University, Professor Zhang Jianyu from BRI Great Development Institute, and uh, Professor Jiang Kejun from Energy Research Institute, uh, belong to um, the National Development and Reform Commission. It is also a great honor to have Mr. Li Keqin uh, with us today. Uh, Mr. Li is the CEO who works with the Bank of China in Hungary. Um, we are talking about great development. Um, I think you know China and Europe share the same goal, uh, which is uh, great development, uh, sustainable uh, development. Uh, we all know. Um, both China and the European Union member states are uh, currently undergoing the great transformation. In order to achieve the goal, I think China and Europe need to work together to have more communication, to have more support, to support each other. I believe today's seminar is very important in this regard. I wish wish it a, a great success. Thank you. So thank, thanks for the uh, welcoming remarks by uh, Professor Feng Zhongping. It seems after the opening session, uh, my camera can open. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good news. Uh, and uh, lastly, I also uh, would like to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Zhang Keqing, uh, the, uh, the head of the Bank of China in Budapest. Uh, Bank of China is a very important partner for the China Sea Institute. So I highly welcome his participation and uh, looking forward for his speeches uh, in the next session. So shortly, I will close uh, this opening session and we can move to the discussion part. So I will turn to the floor. I will leave the floor to uh, Mr. Uh, Zhang Yongshen uh, to uh, take over the uh, moderation. Uh, Professor Zhang, please. Thank you okay, for your work. Uh, th thank you, Professor Chen. Uh, uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yongxin Zhang, the director of uh, Research Institute for Eco Civilization at, at, at CAS, uh, Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, it's my great honor to moderate this session. Uh, today, we have 
four distinguished uh, panelists, two from China and two from um, Hung Hungary. Yeah. Professor Zhang Haibin is from uh, Peking University. He is specialized in international relations. Professor Jiang Kejun is from an Energy Research Center that uh, belongs to the belong uh, National Development Commission, which is a very powerful uh, agency. Yeah. Uh, uh, both are among the best scholars in China. They have strong influence in China, not just in academia, but also uh, parts, uh, parts making. Uh, two uh, Hungarian uh, and colleagues are from uh, Anto Joseph Logic Center, and Professor uh, uh, Separate Stuart, yeah, yeah. Please forgive me, my pronunciation is not accurate. I could, I don't know, Hungarian, yeah, yeah. So, um, Professor Separate, uh, Separate Stuart, um, uh, he's a director of the AGKC, and uh, also uh, Vasali um, Cecilia, he's a, she's a senior researcher at the uh, AGKF, yeah. Um, we yeah, each each we talk about fifty minutes. After uh, four speakers finish, we have some discussion. Yeah, hopefully, if we have time. Yeah, so I'm not going not going to waste uh, time. Yeah, and now I turn uh, I give the floor floor to uh, Professor Zhang Haibin. Yeah, Haibin, uh, the floor is yours. Yes. Oh, thank you, thank you, Professor Yongshen. Uh, it's uh, it's my big pleasure and a big honor uh, to have a chance to join uh, today's very important uh, event. Uh, I I noticed that this the size of the seminar is not uh, that big, but the quality of the people are very high. Uh, so this is a very uh, uh, it's my big honor and a pleasure to join this event. And at the same time, uh, let me uh, please allow me to thank uh, <clears throat> the, the organizers uh, for their kind invitation. So I like to uh, share uh, my PPT. Okay. It seems. I think it's good, right? It works. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, very well. Yes, uh, because I just have only 15 minutes. Uh, the, the PPT is quite long. Uh, so I, I just want to, uh, to save time, just, um, you know, and to outline my major arguments and observations regarding this topic. So today, uh, I'd like to uh, touch on uh, in how to define uh, China's role in international climate negotiations. Actually, two questions here. Uh, first is how to define China's role in the last 30 years of China's you know, participation of international climate negotiations. Uh, second question, i like to you know, um, explain why there is a big shift uh, uh, from, uh, in terms of China's, you know, uh, the role uh, from uh, participant and the contributor to leader, or uh, another expression is torch bearer in international climate negotiations in the last 30 years. So I, I will focus on the two questions. Now as a background, I like to begin with a very brief introduction of the international uh, climate negotiations, a very brief, several minutes. Uh, the, the first question is about how to look at the last 30 years uh, international climate negotiations. Uh, this is 30 years is not short time. Um, but I think that uh, if we look back at the last 30 years of international climate negotiations, I think several milestones should be remembered. Uh, the first, of course, is UNFCCC in uh, 1992, uh, because uh, this uh, UNFCCC set up the uh, solid foundation uh, uh, for the uh, 
last 30 years, uh, climate negotiations. That's the most important uh, legal framework for international climate negotiations. And uh, uh, that, that's the upcoming uh, Glasgow uh, COP26, actually, uh, this is the continuation of this talk and the negotiation of the UNFCCC this under this framework. Then I think the second milestone, I think that should be uh, the Kyoto Protocol uh, in 1997. And I think that the importance of this uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol lies in the uh, fact that they actually we have uh, the quantitative uh, um, legally binding target for developed countries. And then at the same time, developing countries promise to take a voluntary action against climate change. So this, this is another very important legal framework for international climate negotiation. The third one, I would argue that the uh, <clears throat> ADP uh, 2011 uh, ADP, because uh, ADP 2011 in South Africa, that actually uh, starts the process of the negotiation of a Paris Agreement. Then we, we, we have in you know, the Paris Agreement in 2015. So now for us, the most important uh, legal framework for international climate negotiation, I think it should be a Paris Agreement. Uh, I think that's, that's uh, universally accepted. And uh, that's the, I think the several milestones in, in the last 30 years, uh, international climate negotiations. Therefore, Therefore, I think some progress has been made in international climate negotiations, although some people in many countries still are not happy, uh, satisfied with the progress uh, which has been made in this part. Uh, uh, there are some disputes and controversies regarding how to you know, assess the last 30 years performance of international climate negotiations. Then we have some you know, uh, changes and uh, evolutions in la actually last 30 years, we uh, witnessed a lot of uh, changes and evolution. Uh, to be brief, several things. First, that we can see the goals of international climate negotiations becoming increasingly implicit and uh, concrete. Uh, to be brief, actually at the beginning, the objective of global climate governance and climate negotiations are very general, are very general. And as time went on, we have a quantitative a target for, for the cooperation. For example, uh, at the beginning, I think in Doha uh, 2012, uh, Doha Climate Conference uh, reached consensus that the international community should seek to limit uh, global average temperature rise to two degrees Celsius. And then in, uh, in Paris Agreement, uh, which uh, was reached uh, in 2015, uh, then uh, two degrees Celsius is a legally binding target. And at the same time, the parties promise uh, to work harder to achieve the objective of uh, one point degree Celsius. So now in terms of the goals uh, from the just very general uh, to, to increasingly you know, concrete and quantitative, that's a big change. Uh, second uh, change or evolution is in principles. I think that uh, so now this, when, when, when we talk about UNFCCC cooperation negotiations, I think we, of course, we have several uh, basic fundamental principles guiding the negotiations and the cooperations. They are respectively CBDR, a common but differentiated, uh, differentiated responsibility, sustainable development, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, fair, uh, and uh, uh, equitable principle, and also the uh, uh, taking the national circumstances conditions into account. Uh, this, these principles are very uh, important, fundamental, uh, and uh, a lot of changes in this regard. The third uh, change, I would argue, that's the uh, mitigation, uh, mitigation mode. Uh, I think this is extremely important. Uh, under the Kyoto Protocol framework, this is. Uh, uh, the the uh, framework is characterized by the sort of a top-down approach. Then today we have uh, in the Glasgow negotiations, uh, which is you know, act and guided by the sort of uh, you know Paris Agreement, which is characterized by bottom-up uh, approach. We are very much different, uh, very much different. Uh, this is a big change. 
then the last but the least, I think the, the big change is uh, sort of uh, negotiating blocks. So last 30 years, saw so a lot of changes in, terms of in the uh, uh, negotiating blocks. So uh, in, in among developed countries, so we have uh, US-led umbrella group and then the, we have EU. Uh, and, and at the same time, among developing countries, a lot of uh, in, uh, groups. Uh, groups. Uh, we have uh, basic four, uh, we have African countries, we have small island uh, and uh, least developed countries. Uh, we have uh, you know, other uh, many uh, small groups among developing countries. So, and at the same time, we have a compilation of the high ambition allies uh, uh, getting developed countries and developing together. So this is a very complicated uh, uh, negotiation process, uh, which is uh, very different from the beginning uh, of the negotiations. But uh, at the beginning, uh, just a you know, very clear line between you know, the global south and the global north, big change. So nowadays, a very clear, uh, uh, last 30 years, so this sort of a, you know, the basic feature of global uh, climate governance and international uh, climate uh, negotiations as a multi-level and the multi-stakeholders with poor co uh, coordination among them. Uh, this is uh, universally uh, recognized and accepted. Okay, so now let me uh, touch on uh, the uh, China's role uh, in international climate negotiations. So how to look at how to define the China's role? I think different people, different countries have different ideas and opinion in this regard. So how to define? Uh, my uh, personal observation and understanding uh, um, is this. So I, first uh, of all, I apply three criteria to do this observation, uh, three indicators. First is evolution of China's position in international uh, climate uh, change. Uh, negotiations. Second, China's domestic climate actions. The third lay is that, you know, the uh, major events uh, in international climate negotiations. So I base the, uh, I base my observation of China's role in different periods of time in climate negotiations on these three uh, indicators. By that, so my, my uh, observation is this, Actually, China's last 30 years participation in climate negotiation, we can divide the participation into th three different periods and the different roles. The first period uh, starts from uh, 1990 uh, to the, the year 2006. Uh, this is the first period, uh, which is characterized by sort of an active participant. Uh, China's role is active participant. By active participant, I mean, for uh, three things. Number one, uh, China is active in participation of UN climate negotiations. Number two, uh, China is active in defending developing countries' rights to development uh, uh, in participation of uh, climate negotiations. Number three, uh, China is active uh, in domestic energy saving and preservation. Uh, this is what I mean by sort of China's active participation, uh, that's what I mean. Number two, the second period uh, time uh, is from the year 2007 uh, to, to 2014. And I caught the role as active contributor. Uh, a contributor is more, uh, more active in just, uh, you know, uh, participant uh, in terms of, but this is quantitative change, not a qualitative change. By that, I mean four things. Uh, number one, uh, China began to mainstream uh, China's climate policy and actions. Number two, uh, China is more flexible in climate negotiations. Number three, uh, China take a lot of measures to strengthen institutions and organizations and the mechanisms for fighting against climate change. The last but not the least, uh, China work hard to push forward UN climate negotiations uh, in terms of, uh, you know, Bali uh, low map negotiations and the Copenhagen conference. Uh, China did a lot of work and uh, push, uh, the, push forward the negotiations. 
Then uh, comes to uh, the most recent period of time, which is the uh, third period of time. Uh, I think the, the, the period of time starts from the 2015 uh, to present. Uh, these, during this uh, time, I called uh, China's role as sort of uh, active torch bearer or uh, the foreign uh, countries or foreign friends uh, call China's role as a leader, but Chinese government never used the leader. Uh, we, 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 we use a torch bearer or taking a driving seat to describe China's role uh, in international uh, climate negotiations. Here, then it has much to do with the sort of a leader or leadership. And here I, I like to define the meaning of a leader or leadership. If we say China is a leader, what does it mean? Uh, for me, at least uh, it, it means four, uh, four things. Number one, uh, if, if China is a leader, it should lead in issue and the value framing and agenda setting at the global level. Secondly, uh, if China is a leader, it should, be lead, it should lead in removing the major obstacles in international environmental negotiations. Thirdly, uh, China, if, if China is a leader, it should lead in achieving green and low carbon economy. The last but not the least, uh, if China is a leader, it should lead in providing necessary foreign aid to developing countries. So by this uh, criteria, uh, then I would argue that firstly, uh, China leads by contributing the concepts and the theory ideas of ecological civilization and a community with a shared future for mankind to global climate governance. Uh, so President Xi Jinping uh, on many occasions uh, repeatedly uh, contribute uh, China's ideas and the values to international climate cooperation. Uh, on many occasions, he strongly advocates for, for, the, for the two uh, values and the theories. Uh, number two, uh, China needs by facilitating Paris climate negotiation. Uh, China did have a lot of work and made a lot of contributions to the success of Paris uh, negotiations. I think the, this is universally accepted by the international community. So a lot of data here. Uh, thirdly, uh, China leads by intens uh, intensifying domestic mitigation efforts. Uh, here, I don't want to go into details because my colleague, uh, Professor Zhang Yongsen and, um, uh, and uh, Professor Zhang Kejun, uh, they will spend a lot of time uh, uh, focused on this. Uh, so I just, um, <clears throat> I don't want to go into details of this. Uh, so now we, we, we are constantly with a lot of debate on, you know, on the 2030 target, uh, the commitment to China. Uh, that's very, very impressive. Number four, uh, China needs by strengthening South to South cooperation on climate change. So last uh, one thing, uh, the last 10 years saw a lot of progress in China's strongly you know, pushing forward uh, South to South climate negotiations. Here are a lot of uh, figures and the data here. Now, uh, I just very briefly uh, explain why the shift happened. Uh, from China, you know, from the initial, you know, uh, participant and uh, contributor to torture bearer. Because uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, China's, you know, uh, as uh, the role as a participant and the contributor, this is sort of, you know, um, the change is uh, the, not the substantial. Uh, this is a quantitative uh, change, but China's role as a contributor to torch bearer or leader, this is a qualitative or I call it a substantial change. So how to explain the substantial change? I, I like to you know, look at this issue uh, from three levels. Internationally first, um, the increasing threat to global ecological security arises from climate change. Number two, the fundamental adjustment of international economic configuration Number three, the substantial change of international configuration of greenhouse gases emissions. Number four, the intensified global trend of green and low carbon development. I think these four you know, uh, um, points or four reasons at a global level work together 
to push China to play the role of a torch bearer. This is international level. At the national level, I would argue uh, two reasons are very important. Number one is the change of China's economic development stage. So in the past, China's you know, main um, priority is pursuit of uh, you know, the, the GDP growth, the quantity of GDP growth. But nowadays, China is very much uh, you know, uh, em uh, emphasized uh, on the importance of the high quality development. Uh, actually, this the given the uh, uh, economic development stage, uh, to a large extent explains why China pursues different international climate policy and their position to, to a large extent uh, can be explained by the different state because we have a different domestic uh, strategy, strategy and the different national interests. And the different national interests and the strategy will determine China's position in climate negotiations. The other uh, reason I would argue and emphasize is that increasing negative impact of climate change on China's national security that push China to play more important role and active role in the, in the climate negotiations. So in, in China now, uh, fight against the climate change and uh, environment pollution, this is you know, considered as one part uh, China's national security framework. Well, this is Xi Jinping's overall national security outlook, well, you can see uh, environment resources and uh, climate security already you know, considered as China's uh, part of national security. So individually, um, I, I, would, I would argue that uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping's preferences and the personality matter in explanation of China's big shift. Uh, by that, I mean two things. First, President Xi Jinping really wants to do something big. He's a leader with a global vision. Number two, uh, President Xi Jinping is a very much pro-environment, uh, very much environment. His envi environmental awareness is uh, so impressive to us. Uh, he, he, uh, he, you know, for example, he strongly advocated for ecological civilization. Uh, you can, and they made a lot of contributions since you know, the year 2012 and you know, after the 18th, uh, the, the party's national congress. So uh, substantial uh, progress has been made in China's ecological civilization construction and the environmental protection and the carbon economy and the transition in this regard. Conclusions, last the slide. Uh, three uh, conclusions. Number one, as global climate governance and international climate negotiations faces grave challenges, China's leadership becomes increasingly prominent. The China solution, China value, China outlook is in gaining more and more traction. Number two, taking the leadership in global climate governance and international climate negotiations is the best way to illustrate and China's and show China's international image as a responsible member and the power of the international community. The last but not the least, it must be soberly recognized that China's role as a torchbearer or leader is preliminary. China's capacity and the capability to set agendas in international climate negotiations and the power to make the rules and have the last say in the reform of global climate governance regime and the capability to construct and build Chinese discourses in global climate governance are quite limited. That's my observation. More efforts must be made to address the weakness and the shortcomings. So looking into the future, China should promote overall progress in climate governance and international climate negotiations in three and four ways. Cl climate diplomacy, climate security, climate communication and the climate governance so that we can you know, strongly and powerfully lead international climate negotiations and global climate governance. With that, I conclude my talk and I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank, thank you, you Haidin. Uh, uh, very interesting, you provide a very comprehensive picture 
is uh, uh, very helpful for us to uh, understand China's role in climate negotiation over the last of, uh, three decades. Yeah, we may have some uh, 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 questions at the end of the session. And uh, uh, for all participants, if you have any questions, you may leave your uh, questions in the chat room. Yeah, please. Yeah. Now, uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Director Saprej uh, Stuart. Yeah. Stuart, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, welcome. Um, and uh, thank you for, for the opportunity to speak in such an um, esteemed uh, panel. Uh, and my speech, uh, my presentation is going to be very much connected to, um, to Professor uh, Zhang's um, um, lecture, because I think that that really the, the important um, um, message that, that I would like to um, highlight here is that the, the, the question of leadership in climate uh, negotiations and green transition is going to be the key challenge, but also the opportunity uh, in the upcoming years. And, uh, and I learned a lot in, in how China sees its position, how it shifted um, in, the, in the last three decades. And I will argue that also the European Union's position has shifted um, uh, to a great degree um, in a very short time period, much shorter than, than what was uh, presented regarding China. Um, and I believe that the European Union's position has shifted in the last uh, two years. Um, so I, in, in my speech, I wanted to focus on the multi-annual financial framework and the next generation EU as the main tools, um, how the European Union has, um, has changed its, its approach to green transition. But I'm going to uh, start with a bit broader picture because I think that, that really the message of, of the importance of climate diplomacy um, is really um, um, uh, crucial. And uh, also in order to conduct a successful climate diplomacy, um, the, the, the negotiating side's uh, position and, and really world view has to be understood. So I would highlight that we are talking, when we, when we are looking at green transition um, and, and the whole green revolution, if we may say, uh, from a European perspective, we are in a completely different environment than we were in 2019. In the end of 2019, December, the, the then new uh, von der Leyen uh, Commission has set out to have the European uh, Green Deal uh, revolutionize a green economy, green industry, and uh, if I may say a green way of life in the European Union. And that was firmly um, connected to the European Union's global leadership or supposed global leadership position in, in, uh, in the field of green transition, but it did not have a strong geopolitical angle. Um, in 2020, all of the plans on the, of the von der Leyen Commission and the European Union were upset. And the European Union has embarked on a completely different trajectory, if I may say. Uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, and because of the increasing uh, global competition uh, between the great powers that uh, President von der Leyen was, uh, was categorizing in her recent uh, State of the Union address in September as an era of hyper-competitiveness. Uh, she was arguing that we are living in an era of hyper-competitiveness, and this has to show the vision of how the European Union should um, um, do its policies, even when it comes to the green transition. So now what we can see is that for the European Union, green transition is a, is a um, flagship project for achieving some kind of global leadership. So my question is, when China is looking for global leadership position, when the European Union is looking for global leadership position, how can they conduct their negotiations? How can, how can they, they share the responsibilities, work together? Because, because if they don't understand each other's position, that can create a problem in the future. So um, 
with the European Union embarking on this uh, green transition process, of course, um, the European Union had the industries and the organizations that can deliver um, the green transition when it comes to technology or, or the, the economic backbone of, the, of this economic revolution. What I would argue is that it did not have the finances and it did not have the political will to do it. And this has changed in 2020 because of the pandemic and because of the increasing competition. So first of all, the European Union is looking for a way out from the financial crisis of the pandemic. And the only way out is green transition. Um, the problem is that this green transition costs an amount of money that the European Union cannot uh, itself uh, provide. And the multi-annual financial framework is going to provide 1.1 trillion euros during the period of 2021 to 2027. And the next generation EU plan is going to provide 750 billion euros. In the upcoming years, it's going to be front loaded. So it's going to be mostly spent in the, in the, in the next two, two or three years. Um, we have some arguments of how much of this approximately 2 trillion euros is going to be spent on green transition. The numbers are somewhere around 30 to 50%. So we are talking about 700 to 1 trillion euros going directly for causes uh, and initiatives um, uh, benefiting green transition. The problem is that this is nearly not enough. And it, it's a problem that we have to talk about a, a trillion euros of investment as, as not a large enough sum, but still that's the that's that's the that's the reality. Um, we have to consider this amount of money that the European Union is going to provide um, as a um, as a seed investment, as a as an investment which is enabling private companies to invest in green technology. Are they going to do it? Um, and uh, the reality is that when we talk about this amount of public finances for green transition every euro has to be met with another three or four euros coming from the private sector or international partners. And I think this is key, that it can either come from, from companies or investors from the European Union or outside of the European Union. Now, everybody's looking for green investment, that's true. Um, and we have to note that the European Union is also trying to attract green investments. It can provide some, but mostly it wants to attract for its own transition. And that's also an, a, a completely new era that we have to face. So what I would argue is that the European Union is looking to become a sui generis. It is a politically a sui generis political entity. It's not a federation. It's not a confederation. It's, it's something different. It's trying to become a sui generis global great power. It wants to become a green great power. Um, and moving forward, that's going to create opportunities and challenges in the international field. And as we heard in uh, Professor Zhang's speech, um, China is also looking for that uh, leadership position. And the United States under the Biden administration is looking for some kind of a leadership position. And that's something that we have to take very much into consideration in the upcoming uh, years when we are con uh, considering the the climate negotiations and green transition negotiations. And uh, the last point that I would like to argue is that really coming from the European point of view, we have recently published our State of the Union report, analyzing the recent State of the Union address. And there we, we underline the challenge that the European Union is facing. And the challenge is that the European Union wants to achieve strategic autonomy, very much connected to green transition, but also foster international cooperation as, and serve as a, as, a, as a beneficial partner for developing countries, for developed countries all around the globe. How can it balance these two roles? It's going to be very challenging. And for that, international cooperation is key. Because if these issues are not discussed um, with, the, with, the, with outside partners, then the European Union can close in, deal with its own problems, 
And green transition and climate change, fighting against climate change is exactly the topic that, that nobody can do alone. So I think these are the great challenges. The finances are there in the European Union to provide a significant seed investment for green transition, but the political vision is not set. It's not set in the European Union how it's going to approach international cooperation and achieving strategic autonomy. And this can create major challenges in the future that must be solved through uh, international negotiations. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. OK, uh, thank you, uh, Director Saprejia. Uh, your talk, you mentioned the challenge and the opportunities, and it's very encouraging. Uh, uh, from your talk, I say a huge uh, potential for uh, collaboration uh, between China and uh, Europe. I think a win-win situation can must be uh, created. Yeah. Our next speaker is Professor Jiang Kejun. Uh, he is one of the most influential figures in energy study in, in, in China. Uh, his papers can, can be found in uh, Nature uh, Science, some uh, top journals, and he is also very influential in the parts making. Uh, uh, Kejun, the uh, floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Professor. Can you see my PPT? Yeah, 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 sure. That's great. Okay, yeah. uh, so I'll finish that within uh -huh. 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, my background, we are working in Energy Research Institute, Institute for the Energy Transition under the Global uh, Greenhouse Gas Mitigation and also Local Air Pollutant Emission Control. So today I just present what we did in the last um, several decades. But up to now, we mainly focus on the uh, global 1.5 degree uh, pathways, because I also heavily involved in the IPCC report, the special report on the 1.5 degree. And now I'm also, now it's the lead author for the IPCC R6 uh, for what group three. Okay, so uh, basically the carbon neutrality for China is also follow the global 1.5 degree pathways. That's uh, if we want to have for, the 1.5 degree warming target is in between 2050 and 2060. Uh, this is the lowest, the blue line shows that. And for the two degree uh, is uh, the green line. That's also need to be uh, net zero emission between 2070 to, uh, to 2080. Uh, so we also did a study by following this two target. Uh, the good news is uh, uh, last year, the President Xi Jinping announced that China's CO2 emission will, will peak before 2030 and also will make effort to be uh, carbon neutrality before 2060 in China. This is uh, good news for us. That means uh, China now have uh, the actually the concrete target for the total CO2 emission in China. In China. Uh, now we already have EU, Canada, China, Japan, Korea, South Africa, US, uh, even though, uh, because this slide I prepared before the China, US announced that. So it's a uh, very good news right now. We nearly have more than 60% global CO2 emission under the target with the carbon neutrality uh, before 2060 or 2050. And uh, now the, the key issues, uh, uh, technology could lead uh, the leading uh, Right now, the technology leading country already had the target on carbon neutral. And also companies are setting up their target of carbon neutral target. And uh, then almost all the, all the country will be carbon neutral. Uh, so far, that's uh, we do hope for, have for some uh, carbon neutrality uh, industry or company club. So we want, can work together, not only for the national one, but also for the for the uh, industry or uh, pro uh, producers will point. And this is a slide we presented uh, from the end of uh, 2016. Uh, at that time, we were really want to push China to take, take the middle century strategy target to follow the two degree and now also 1.5 degrees. So at that time, we did a study to push uh, to be carbon neutrality uh, or net zero emission by 2050 for China. Uh, so I'm, I'm quite happy that China announced the target to be carbon neutrality before 2060. So basically, this, uh, this study is uh, quite con uh, consistent with the national target. This is a study we did for the energy transition scenarios. Uh, 
uh, in the up one is uh, the total primary energy, uh, and the up left one is the, the uh, power generation mix in China. And finally, uh, we if we have very good strategy, so we do hope before 2050, China's the power generation sector can to go to net zero emission. So the fundamental strategies for national uh, carbon neutrality is uh, we push out underused sectors to use electricity. That means the electrification process in all the industries in China. Uh, in the meantime, I mentioned about we are not only for the carbon uh, issues, we also set up a target for China's uh, air quality. Uh, for example, by 2050, uh, China's air quality should uh, reach the uh, uh, WHO standard. Uh, that means that 10 uh, microgram uh, per cubic meter. Uh, but if we want to do this, that means that means all emission from any activities will be nearly zero, uh, because the, the energy sector is easier to control uh, to reduce the air pollutants. So so far, all the effort what we are doing right now is focusing on energy sectors, and uh, we are also working uh, heavily on China's uh, 20, uh, 2030 SDG target. To link with our uh, energy transition, with our the uh, uh, SDG targets, so far uh, we really for pick up five of them to link with our energy uh, transition scenarios. And the paper very nice and the publishing. And uh, <clears throat> what we, we uh, need is uh, uh, to go to the deep uh, cut of CO2 emission or greenhouse gas emission. In China, we really need this overall impact, uh, overall change of economic development pattern. And also energy supply industry should have a strong transition. And uh, we also need transitioning and use sectors. Uh, we also do new, need new manufacturing process in some sector, which is uh, difficult to reduce CO2 emission. Uh, and also the mitigation of greenhouse gas may increase GDP in China. It's a pro uh, perfect news for us. Uh, in many studies, the uh, previous is this that if we do CO2 emission, that could be negative impact, impact on GDP. But our study says uh, it's a strong positive impact on GDP growth rate in China. And also, we also st make study on China's overseas investment are increasing rapidly. And we do hope all the China's overseas investment will could be a, a zero carbon related investment. Uh, right now, we're also working hardly on the, some key sectors in industry, uh, which we call the difficult to make a, a strong uh, deep carbon emission. For example, still making ammonia, benzene, acetylene, methanol, clinker, and also for some industry uh, uh, transport sector, heavy duty transport and airplane. This is the area is difficult. Uh, to reduce their uh, uh, CO2 emission. So we make a uh, study on that part. Uh, Hydrogen-based uh, economy is very really crucial for China. Uh, so we make analysis for the hydrogen demand. If we use this in methanol, acetylene, ammonia, still making airplane, locomotive, ship, and heavy duty truck in China, uh, in China will need uh, more than 50 billion ton of uh, hydrogen. But we also can cover some other chemical industries. So maybe China will need uh, more than 70 million tons of hydrogen. Uh, but uh, the solar PV, uh, solar power generation is a key issue to make very cheap hydrogen uh, production. Uh, so in China, uh, if we can have a very good uh, development for solar PV and the hydrogen uh, price could be much lower than coal-based hydrogen pr production. Uh, make a, it's very competitive in the Chinese economy in China. Uh, right now, I think China's uh, solar PV already go to the uh, price, go to grid around the uh, 10 cent. Chinese yuan is around uh, uh, 1.4 uh, cent US dollar uh, for kilowatt, per, per kilowatt hour. So it's getting to be very cheap. And I already make the hydrogen uh, price low enough to make uh, the industry process. In the meantime, we also work hardly on the nuclear energy to make a hydrogen, which also could be very cheap. But let's see what happened for the next five years. And uh, we also make study to see where we can have very cheap hydrogen base. Sorry, some part of this is still in Chinese, but it's given by province in China. 
some province in the west uh, or north uh, west northeast could have very rich uh, uh, hydrogen uh, availability, for example, in the Mongolia, Ningxia province, Gansu province, and Qinghai province, altogether they can have for around uh, uh, 150 million ton of hydrogen availability, which were cheap, uh, were low cost. And this study actually from the EU, they showed if we have very cheap hydrogen, and still making process by use hydrogen process, uh, direct reduction process to make iron is uh, could be uh, cheaper than uh, traditional blast furnace uh, process uh, in the cost. For example, if the electricity price could be 2.2 uh, euro cent per kilowatt hour, and uh, the, the hydrogen process to make steel could be cheaper than the electric, electric art furnace to make the steel. And this is study we make uh, uh, in the China uh, because we, underst we understand that the, the carbon neutrality could have a very strong impact on China's economy. This is uh, could be a reallocation of the process. The left hand show you the, the products uh, by province in 2018. The, the right hand uh, picture show you the, the products by province in 2050. The upper one is uh, steel making and the lower one is acetylene production. You can see by 2050, all the manufacturing process is go to the north part of China. It's totally di different with today's uh, uh, location of the other products. That means uh, if China can go to carbon neutrality by 2050, the reallocation of economy manufacturer uh, zone could be totally changed. This will have a big strong in a uh, very strong impact on China's economic development. And uh, one good news is uh, that the solar PV is getting very cheap. In the last 10 years, China is a really amazing uh, uh, process to do renewable energy, including solar PV. This show you the yellow one is the solar PV installed in 2012. The, uh, uh, the orange one show that uh, the newly increased capacity in 2013 in China in 2013 doubled than the previous installed capacity. But by 2019, we don't compare with other countries anymore because China is really, really top uh, for the installed capacity for solar PV. And this is by 2019, uh, China total installed capacity is more than 200 gigawatt. Uh, but uh, by uh, 2020, again, we installed one year installed more than 50 gigawatt. Uh, and this year is expected to more than 100 gigawatt installed, uh, newly installed capacity for solar PV uh, right now. So the solar, solar PV increased very rapid, just because in last 10 years, the cost of solar PV reduced 92% in China. So now they, uh, the uh, solar PV uh, power generation is already cheaper than existing coal fire power plant. And uh, another good story is that the nuclear power is moving very well. And uh, our team is really giving a uh, very big uh, expectation on nuclear power generation in China. We do hope that it can come in soon uh, with a very big uh, installed, installed capacity. And uh, some new technologies is also coming. The e power technology from Nissan in Japan, and uh, they started manufacturing in 2017. And only with the, the uh, while low uh, oil consumption per 100 kilometers, only 2.7 liters per 100 kilometer. And this year, they bring this technology to China. And also some other very good technology in China is uh, uh, the electric uh, battery uh, bus, which is uh, perfect for per charge. They can go more than 800 kilometers. It's already uh, manufactured in China. And uh, the last slide I'm gonna show you, we do hope uh, the China's overseas investment could be low carbon related because nowadays the China's overseas investment is already more than 150 billion uh, per year uh, and will increase quickly in the coming future. One good news is uh, the President Xi Jinping announced just uh, two weeks ago that uh, China will stop to invest any coal fire power plant overseas. So this is totally match with our study. And uh, uh, we do hope uh, that maybe by 2050, the China's OS investment could be uh, more, more than 800 billion US dollar. So if one third of that is go to carbon neutrality uh, related 
this can help a lot with the other developed countries uh, in the world and get them to be also carbon neutrality. The last slide I'll also show you the increased GDP uh, is uh, uh, one of the study. If we go to carbon neutrality or two degree pathways, the GDP actually increased. And that's my slide. Thank you very much. Thanks, I finish here. Uh, thank you, Kejun. Uh, Kejun is a, a modeling professor. Uh, his research is always based on, is, is evidence-based, uh, and he is uh, very optimistic to, to China's uh, green transition, and I, I really share his optimism. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Kejun. Uh, our next speaker is um, Vasari Cecilia. Um, uh, she is a senior researcher at the AGKC. Uh, Vasari, the floor is yours. Vasari. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Go ahead. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the introduction as well. Um, so, as the title of my uh, presentation uh, indicates, I would like to give a very quick um, overlook about what challenges the different countries might expect uh, with the new legislative measures taking place. I would like to connect my presentation uh, a little bit to Joel's previous presentation. Uh, but before talking about the different countries, I would like to, to take a step back and uh, mention the European Commission's three main goals related uh, to achieving sustainable development. And um, three main goals are ensuring um, competitive energy prices for consumers and ensuring the security of energy supply and reducing the environmental impact of the energy system to, well, let's say acceptable levels. Um, I would like to share my screen with you. I'm not sure whether you can see it right now. We can see it. Thank you. So before um, before going on, it's it's also um, worth to take a look uh, on uh, on the share of energy from renewable sources in Europe because for more than two decades the European Union has been at the forefront of, um, of global renewable energy deployment. And um, actually, two years ago, um, renewable energy represented almost twenty percent of energy consumed in the European Union, as you can see on the chart. Um, you might also see that uh, among EU member states, Sweden had by far the, the highest share of renewable energy sources in its gross final consumption, but also Finland, Latvia, Denmark, and Austria are at the forefront of renewable energy consumption. Uh, regarding Hungary, unfortunately, we are at the other end of the scale, and um, the share of energy from renewable sources was around 10% in the last couple of years. So uh, what to do in, in order to increase these numbers? Um, well, in the shadow of uh, COVID-19, it's a quite difficult question. Um, because uh, one of the biggest questions governments face is how to build back their economies. But the European Union is a firm supporter of, uh, of an efficient economic recovery. And uh, this recovery has a twofold goal. One is to restore employment and economic activity, but there is another, and there is another goal, and this is to reach climate neutrality. And, uh, and to limit CO2 emissions across Europe. So going to the Visegrad countries 
in the in the last decade, um, in the countries of the Visegrad group, there was a gradual diversification of uh, energy supply sources, and um, there was a systematic increase in the importance of, of renewable energy sources. Um, actually, we can say that um, that this um, diversification accelerated significantly after these countries have joined the European Union. And, um, and despite their differences, um, for example, in geography or in economy, Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia and Hungary share some common aspects uh, uh, when it comes to the use of uh, renewable energy sources. Um, one well-known example is, the, is the dependency on fossil fuels. This is still a central issue in the region. Um, and it's also well known uh, that Poland and Czech Republic are still some of the most coal intensive electricity producers. But actually, all four Visegrad countries have some existing coal or lignite plants that do not meet, do not meet environmental standards. Um, and we can also mention that, uh, that the frequent changes in legislation uh, create a quite instable investment environment in the B4 countries. At least it used to be like that uh, in the last decade. Um, if you would like to take a closer look on the energy carriers of the B4 countries, in the energy mix of Poland and the Czech Republic, coal ranks first. Poland has a very heavy dependence on cheap domestic coal, and it makes Poland's energy mix one of the least diversified ones in the, in the European Union. In the case of um, Slovakia or Hungary, for example, the dominant source of energy is still nuclear energy. And these two countries are still focusing on increasing energy production from electricity production from nu nuclear sources, which, uh, let's say, actually correlates with the reduction of CO2 emissions. Um, just a couple of words about natural gas and crude oil. In regarding natural gas, in, in some of the V4 countries, the importance of natural gas increased in the, since the 1990s, just like in the case of Poland and the Czech Republic. And in some cases, it decreased, just like in uh, Hungary and Slovakia. Um, and with oil, well, it was pretty much the same with crude oil. Um, the large increase in the demand for crude oil in Poland, for example, is the result of the high demand of uh, road transport services. Poland has become one of the largest road carriers in the EU in the last couple of years. Um, and coming to, renew to the renewables, just very quickly, um, renewables constitute a rather smaller part of the energy balance in the Visegrad countries. Um, on this chart, you can see how the use of renewable energy sources is divided between heating, electricity production, and transport. You can see that the share of renewable energy sources in heating was quite high. And it was also quite high in electricity production. But uh, you can also see that uh, its share was the lowest in transportation. Uh, why is this important? Because actually transportation is one of the fields which the EU would like to reshape in the upcoming years with the new legislation measures. Um, but all in all, even if renewable energy generation is improving, it uh, seems like that at the moment these countries still need coal. Uh, many politicians uh, of the countries in the Visegrad region consider the use of coal to be uh, their significant comparative advantage. Um, and, um, and coal is needed to ensure an optimum level of energy security. So. So some politicians still continue to support the coal, regardless of uh, the aging, inefficient infrastructure, um, even if there is actually a collapse in the European coal sector. But, um, but it still appears to be an important element of prosperity. Um, so on the one hand, uh, um, as Joel has mentioned, uh, there, is a, there is an economic and social reality and on the other hand, there are the environmental goals of the European Union, 
And at this point, there is a choice in, in front of the government. Um, they can either invest in, in retrofitting those plants and potentially create stranded assets. Meanwhile, both regulations and the market moves away from financing coal, or they can choose to start uh, to build new renewable capacities as it is uh, foreset in the, in the next generation EU plan. So it is unavoidable to, to tackle these issues because, uh, because there are some fundamental changes in the European power demand and, and supply, and these changes will require significant steps from the EU. For example, power demand is expected to grow by 40% in the upcoming decades, actually by 2050. And um, these are the, the measures of the International Energy Agency. And it's also important that uh, very probably supply regions and demand regions will be coupled. So as the share of renewables hopefully rises pretty much in the European Union, power generation centers might shift toward uh, the, the more attractive regions, which are the southern and the northern parts of Europe. Um, so regions with energy intensive industries, uh, such as Central Europe, might become increasingly dependent on, on imports. So this is the, the current situation, and there are some new institutional man, milestones aiming to, to change this situation. Joas has already mentioned the next generation uh, EU plan, and I would like to talk about uh, the Fit for 55 package. Um, this is one of the crucial steps the EU is trying to reach carbon neutrality. Um, it might, um, might sound like a slogan for, for a gym class, but it's not. The plan is to cut the European Union's greenhouse gas emissions by 55% by 2030. Uh, what does this package contain? So it's a quite jumbo package containing hundreds of pages of legislative proposals. But the most important points include, uh, firstly, the profound restructuring of energy taxation in Europe. And there are also increased renewable energy and energy efficiency targets in the proposal. Uh, regarding these first two points, I think it's important to stress that uh, while these first two measures are not innovative, but these upgrade uh, of these two existing instruments could deliver the, the majority of the, of the emission reductions by 2030. And just a very quick look on the main new additional measures. Um, there will be a new EU emission trading system, which will include residential buildings and road transport in the trading system. When talking about the ETS in the last 15 years, we have been talking about uh, companies, only about companies. Now we are talking about households as well. So now the point is to bring decarbonization to the level of households. Mm, and this is a proposed second emission trading system, let's say, for residential buildings and transport. Mm, this will require huge investments. Um, according to the calculations of the European Commission, it might require 800 billion euros per year. And there is no doubt that consumers will have to pay much of this investment. So while implementing these, um, these plan measures, governments must develop policies to, to ensure that uh, it is economically feasible, it is financially feasible for households to switch to clean alternatives in the European Union. And um, there will be also uh, revised CO2 emission standards for new cars, as you can see at the fourth point. And there will be a farewell to combustion engine cars. What does this mean? The plan is the full decarbonization of road transport by 2050 in Europe. Let's say that the average lifespan of a car is around 15, 20 years. And 
the full conversion of the European car park will take place between 2035 and 2050. So it is a time frame in which hopefully electric cars will become affordable for all. So we will be pushed out of our internal combustion engine cars tomorrow, uh, but manufacturers already have to think about how to reshape their production. And uh, last but not least, um, there is uh, the controversial cargo border adjustment mechanism, the so-called CVM. And CVM is about charging the carbon content of imports to a level equal to domestic carbon pricing within the European Union. It is widely debated in Europe, it's widely debated uh, globally. Um, this measure officially intends to ensure, uh, let's say, level playing field uh, for European businesses. So all in all, this package would both deepen and broaden the decarbonization of Europe, and, and the, um, it would help Europe to achieve climate neutrality by 2050. Um, and just to conclude very quickly, the EU has been um, promoting itself um, as, as um, the worst climate leader. Um, and yes, the EU is the third biggest emitter of green, greenhouse gases. So Europe can do a lot, but uh, as it's, it has been said before, Europe alone cannot reach fundamental changes. Um, Europe can put all the sustainability principles uh, you like in, uh, in different uh, deals, but without means for control, without monitoring, um, without enforcement or legal consequences, um, it might fail. So um, maybe they aren't worth a thing and, uh, and global cooperation is just crucial to, um, to have. Uh, all these changes worldwide. So thank you very much, and I'm looking forward for the Q&A session. Thank you, Vasali. Yeah, that's very interesting and uh, informative. Yeah, uh, we have uh, some time for questions. And uh, the uh, first question is for you uh, from uh, Professor Jiang Kejun, as you can uh, say from the uh, chat room. Yeah. So what, what the question is, what is the future of nuclear energy in EU, the new generation of nuclear technologies uh, to you? Yeah, if you can answer it uh, uh, right now, or you need to uh, wait for wait for seconds. <laughs> Another question, is, I guess it's, it, it's for uh, Professor uh, uh, Jiang Kejun. Uh, the question is from uh, Stuart, yeah. We have a great debate among EU member states uh, complicating the internal negotiations regarding renewable and nuclear energies. How can China develop them um, both in, in parallel? How did China come to a balance between the two energy sources? Yeah, who's going to answer que uh, the <laughs> question first? Yeah, yeah. Kejin or Vasali? Who's ready? Yeah. First, yeah, I, I can go, go first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, in China, anyway, even though uh, uh, I think twenty in twenty twenty, the newly installed capacity for wind and uh, solar uh, in China accounts for more than fifty percent of global newly installed capacity. Uh, but the renewable is still too small. We need much more uh, zero carbon energy, including nuclear. Uh, China is working hardly on the third generation nuclear power plant. Right now, we all have eight units of third generation power plant uh, under operation. And this year, we have another, uh, uh, another seven uh, units of third generation uh, units start construction and one uh, units for uh, uh, fourth generation uh, already start operation right now. Uh, we also have another two fourth generation nuclear reactors start construction. So China really take a nuclear power plant, a nuclear energy, not only for power generation, but also for space heating and uh, for heat supply and also for hydrogen manufacture. China is working hard on that one. We already have for 
uh, reserved nearly 400 gigawatt nuclear power plants, the site for that. Uh, for the fourth generation, we started new project with this very remote area. They don't need water. Uh, so it's all good news for us. Uh, so China is doing such kind of technology and then want to be a leading country on the new, new generation of nuclear power plant. So that's the reason why I'm also quite interested in um, uh, use uh, nuclear power plant, power, uh, 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 nuclear uh, power uh, project, whether we can work together to be uh, the new technology for nuclear uh, leading countries in the future. Thank you, I'll finish here. Okay, uh, thank you, Kajin. Uh, was Sally ready? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So, in this case, um, regarding nuclear energy, yeah, as, as I have said, there is a very strong political support for nuclear energy um, in Hungary, and uh, there are um, four existing uh, nuclear plants uh, in the country right now. Um, regarding um, regarding the topic of, of nuclear of nuclear energy, um, it always um, comes to the topic how to how to adjust um, um, the electricity system to any changes which um, might take place um, in the in the electricity grid. So so the, the whole energy infrastructure, especially the electricity system is uh, another problem arising uh, during the transition um, um, to, to, to renewable sources or during uh, to, to the um, installment of new, of new um, nuclear uh, uh, installment. So the electricity networks of the Visegrad countries and uh, their system interconnections with neighboring countries have been designed so that um, they are based on the energy produced from coal or nuclear energy distributed from specific production sites to another re to other regions of the country so when for example one or another um, energy supply is removed from the energy mix it will be necessary to to redesign the entire energy infrastructure of of these countries. Mm -hmm. For example, um, talking about Poland, if Poland wants to redesign uh, or will have to redesign its entire electricity grid because both offshore wind and nuclear energy are located in the northern part of the country, in contrast to the current location uh, of generation sources, which are in, in the south of the country. So, so there will be a lot of uh, planning stages to, to think about um, during these implementations. Thank you, I would stop there. Excellent, uh, thank you, Vesali. Yeah. I, I, I have a question to, to direct uh, uh, Sapage uh, short, yeah. As you can see uh, from the uh, uh, chat room, yeah. Uh, how smart city, uh, how smart city change people's lifestyle? Because you know, the uh, uh, green transition is not just the, um, uh, the transition of uh, production model, also the, the living pattern, yeah. So I, if we look at uh, the, the cities in China, we can find that about 11% of the cities um, um, they strongly decoupled from uh, carbon emission, I mean, the, the economic growth. But if you look at, uh, yeah, look at the consumption side, yeah, the consumption actually is quite high, quite high, yeah, because the, it means the embodied emission is quite high. So how smart city could change people's lifestyle, yeah. Um, Stuart, yeah, please. Yeah. <laughs> What, what I perceive here in Hungary and in many places in the European Union is that uh, many people are, are unaware of the opportunities that are, that are uh, in smart cities. Usually when they make their, um, their um, demands uh, from, the, from the higher ups, from the, from the administration or the politicians, they are requiring um, making their lives better by enhancing the things that they know that they, that exist roads existing bridges existing buildings 
And they do not necessarily know that there will be an easier way to, uh, for example, not maybe renewing an old road that's now really not uh, that useful, but finding a smart city solution that can make, uh, for example, a new um, chart, a new path through the city that would be much more economical. So I think that what we can see from international uh, experience is that smart cities do make um, do make the the uh, environment and lifestyles more green and more cost of cost effective and more digital. Um, but I think that the problem is that here we come. We were talking about the importance of climate diplomacy, and here it comes to the importance of climate communication and how important it is not only to realize this these um, these solutions because let's face it, they exist. The technologies exist. It's the question who will adopt them. So one of the problems uh, that I think that smart city solutions have is, um, is economies of scale. A few years ago, we had electric bicycles introduced in Budapest, but nobody really knew how to use them. Honestly, I once tried to use them and I didn't know how to figure them out. So when you don't have the necessary amount of people who would opt in to the solution, then you won't get the benefit. So I think that here comes a very important part of public-private partnership and international par partnership that a private company comes up with a solution and then the public organizations can communicate together with the private organization how it would benefit the citizen's lifestyle and showing maybe another city abroad that already adopted such a solution. Because I think that the real problem is awareness, the lack of awareness of the smart city solutions um, because if the, if the public is not uh, willing to adopt them, then you cannot have the green benefits that they would be providing. Okay, uh, thank you, Esther. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Bin. Uh, I, I have a question for you. You talked about the uh, role shift, uh, Chinese role shift in climate negotiation. Uh, I, I was wondering uh, how Chinese development philosophy or development concept change uh, shifts its role in climate negotiation. Yeah. For instance, we may uh, uh, think that um, in the past, we, we thought that um, uh, uh, carbon mitigation could be a, a burden to economic growth, but now we think that um, it's no longer a burden and there's an opportunity for economic growth. So how the, how the shift of concept change your roles here, yeah. have been. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, uh, you know, and this is a very, very interesting and important question. Let me uh, say this way. If we look back at the, you know, China's performance international climate negotiations, we will quickly find uh, some very interesting phenomena. At the beginning, for example, in China, you know, Chinese delegation, when they go to the negotiating table, they are very much focused on sort of, you know, and they, and whether the negotiation will negatively influence on China's economic growth. That time at the beginning, to be honest, China very much focused on sort of, you know, the econo uh, economic uh, GDP growth is the focus of China's national interest at that time. So that I think um, uh, a lot here, we, we know that the, the story at the, at, at the beginning of the negotiation, Chinese delegation is not you know, comfortable with the concept of sustainable development. We focus, we concentrate on sustainable development, which focus on the GDP growth that time. Then gradually we accept the sustainable development, but still focus on economic growth. In the, I think in the first uh, you know, 20 years, but nowadays, I, I mean, uh, in the uh, 21st century, now we have uh, you know, high quality, high quality uh, development uh, concept. We have now the concept of low carbon, uh, green you know, development. And, and I think that we have two new uh, concepts. That is, one is a beautiful China. The other is a beautiful world. Then we actually, the, the philosophy, you, you mentioned philosophy, the concept of uh, uh, development changed dramatically. And it has much to do with, you know, China's, the, um, the, the position in the climate negotiation. So it has much to do with. Just, uh, you know, I, I like to conclude in one sentence, 
the logic is this way. Then the, the concept of, uh, of uh, the change of China's development uh, constant philosophical change, then of a domestic economic strategy change. And then China's uh, position in climate negotiations change. And then China's national interest change. Then finally, the role of China's uh, of China in climate negotiation change. So the logic is very much clear, clear cut, uh, very very clear. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Haibin. Yeah, very interesting answer. Yeah. Um, so we are exactly on a schedule. Yeah. So um, today today's discussion is uh, is very interesting, insightful, and informative. Yeah. Uh, we addressed uh, uh, some uh, challenging questions, but I think we created more questions. Yeah. That time that means that. Uh, uh, we should uh, uh, create more opportunity in the future to meet together. Yeah, I uh, hopefully yeah, we can next time meet in uh, Budapest. Uh, yeah, in person. Yeah, yeah. Um, so finally, I would like to thank all uh, speakers for your excellent uh, talk and uh, uh, participants. Yeah, yeah. Uh, according to the schedule, we we have five minutes for. A fresh break, so we come back uh, at eleven forty. Yeah, now to the next session. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I think yes. we can we can start the next panel discussion. So, dear attendees, uh, thank you for joining today's second panel discussion. I am Zofia Guyash, research fellow of the Andrei Joseph Moritz Center, and I will perform the moderator duties of the second panel discussion. So, in the next one hour, we will uh, listen to the lectures of Mr. Zhang Yongsheng, uh, director and senior researcher of. Uh, Research Institute for Eco Civilization uh, at the Chinese Academy of Social, Social Sciences. Uh, Mr. Hussar Andres, co founder and CEO of uh, Green Policy Center. Mr. Zhang Jianyu, uh, executive director and senior researcher at the BRI Green Development Institute. And last but not least, uh, Mr. Li Kaxin, um, who is the CEO at uh, the Bank of China Limited Hungarian Branch. And then if the time allows, um, of course, we also have a short, uh, maybe 15 minutes Q&A session. So feel free to uh, share your questions and comments with us at the end. Uh, and for this purpose, uh, please also use the chat room. And now I'd like to ask Mr. Zhang Yongsheng to hold his lecture on the topic of green transition in China. Okay, uh, thank you, Gulisa. Uh, uh, I share my screen first here. Yeah. Okay, can does it work? Yeah. Yes, it works. Okay, okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's such a great honor for me to share my ideas on, on green transition in China. Uh, uh, a global carbon neutrality represent a um, paradigm shift that is uh, unprecedented, unprecedented challenges, but uh, uh, in my view, more uh, represent more uh, 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 historical opportunities. So I would like to share how China can seize, seize the historical opportunity of global carbon neutrality. So, so I, I, uh, first I would like to explain uh, why China is so determined to carbon neutrality. Then I talk about uh, the opportunity and the challenges of uh, carbon neutrality. Finally, I would like to briefly talk about uh, how to achieve uh, making uh, transition. Yeah. Uh, 
for why China why China is so determined to to carbon neutrality? Yeah, some people may say that because uh, China is now no longer a poor country, uh, its uh, per capita GDP uh, is greater than um, uh, ten uh, ten thousand uh, um, uh, US dollars. So so this is why China uh, committed um, uh, uh, carbon neutrality. Uh, but uh, this but the development development stage is neither a necessary condition nor a sufficient condition. As we can say that now we have uh, 130 or something countries have already committed a net zero uh, carbon emission and uh, uh, about 70% of the, the, the countries are developing countries. So, and the, the high income, uh, does not necessarily mean the country will be committed to uh, to net zero. Or for instance, yeah, uh, in, in in some in some countries, you can say I don't want to mention yet. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, so some people also say that uh, uh, the China committed to um, to carbon neutrality. Neutrality is because of international pressure. Um, I would like to say that this is never, never the case yet, yeah, because uh, China has always been under international pressure. But if uh, uh, carbon neutrality is not in China's uh, uh, zone interest, I think it's very hard for, for, for China to, yeah, yeah, to, to, to simply to, to say yes simply because of the international. Or pressure, yeah. So the, the reasons, in my view, are, uh, are two. Yeah, two major reasons. Yeah, one is that uh, this um, it, it's in China's own interest. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, now, now uh, the carbon, the, the green transition is a uh, is a long term development strategy in China. It, it's not the fighting climate change is not. Uh, uh, it's not a tactical uh, or op opportunistic uh, behavior. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it simple. Yeah, the, um, uh, since 1978, China started to uh, open and uh, reform uh, its uh, economy. We 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 learn from the uh, advanced uh, uh, countries and uh, China. Um, over the past four decades, China's uh, annual GDP growth rate is, is about uh, nine uh, nine percent or something. So it, it means that every uh, every seven to eight years, its economy get doubled. Yeah. Um, so that achievement is really unprecedented in human uh, history. But uh, unfortunately, the, um, that traditional uh, growth model is no longer sustainable. Um, so we know we have a very rapid growth, but uh, the environmental prices was very high. We, the development is somehow uh, achieved at the price of environment. We had very uh, um, a big problem on air pollution, water pollution, soil pollution, biodiversity loss. So, so the traditional growth model is no longer uh, uh, feasible. Uh, yeah. So, and uh, uh, at the same time, the green transition represents uh, historic opportunities. Yeah. So we can say the new opportunities emerging. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Carbon mitigation is no longer a burden. Yeah, if uh, taking into account the uh, all cost uh, of the traditional growth model, uh, then green development actually is more uh, cost effective. For instance, if we take into account the uh, external cost, uh, the hidden cost, uh, um, uh, long term cost, uh, um, and uh, opportunity cost and the uh, welfare loss, the um, traditional growth model is not as efficient as, uh, as many people think. Yeah. A second major reason I think is uh, China's responsibility to global uh, climate change. Yeah. Now, China is the uh, second uh, largest economy in the world uh, next to the, the US. And uh, it's, it's, it's expected that around 2020, uh, around 2028, China's economy uh, is likely to over, uh, overtake the 
uh, U.S. economy. Yeah. So as uh, the um, uh, second uh, biggest uh, economy challenge is to um, take uh, global responsibility, I think uh, this is uh, this is the two major um, reasons here. So China made this uh, commitment, and uh, many people, some people, um, are questioning if this commitment is firm or credible. I, my answer is uh, no worry. Uh, actually, China is very firm and credible to its commitment here. Yeah. First is uh, many um, people may don't know that China is actually one of the countries taking most serious actions fighting climate change. You can see lots of literatures yeah, from the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So China, uh, well, uh, waged a, a war on pollution and uh, uh, took a very serious uh, um, measures on fighting and uh, pollution. Yeah. For instance, shut down the high polluting in uh, factories and uh, put a cap, an uh, energy cap. Uh, uh, so this is, I, I think that uh, not many country can do uh, like China. Uh, the second is that uh, if we look in a broader uh, context, we can say that uh, eco-civilization, yeah, the term is um, proposed by China, yeah, eco-civilization uh, is introduced in China's constitution and uh, the ruling party's uh, constitution and that has become the national development strategy. And uh, it was also uh, included in a five-year plan and, uh, uh, and uh, specific policies. Yes, yeah, so we have a very comprehensive institutional arrangement to implement it, yeah. The second is the political determination, yeah. We, we, a, the, uh, as you know, uh, in the Chinese policy is very continuous. Yeah, we, we our development strategy and uh, policies wouldn't change as the uh, government change from term to term. Yeah, so we simply uh, use the we so called so called one blueprint. We just add her time to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the opportunities of carbon neutrality, uh, first of all. Uh, I would like to, um, to, to I, I think, yeah, how to understand the opportunity is, um, is, um, uh, is very important. Could you, you know, uh, traditionally, uh, since the industrial revolution, uh, traditional growth model is based on the um, um, uh, fossil fuel import here. Yeah. Yeah, if you want to reduce your fossil fuel, and it means that your economy will be uh, affected, uh, it, will, it will, will slow down, or you need to use the expensive technology uh, and it's very costly. Yeah. So the uh, typical story about uh, climate change is like this, yeah, uh, mitigation, uh, carbon mitigation is a burden. So um, the, the benefits, of, benefits of fighting climate change is to avoid the, the, the damage of, uh, in the future. And so what we, we need to do is to find a balance between the, the cost and uh, benefit. So the uh, discount, the so-called discount rates uh, become um, very uh, important and the debate is based on the, <laughs> on the uh, discount rates. I think this is not, this is problematic, yeah. Uh, in our view, the mitigation could drive, it, it, the mitigation is like, a, a uh, creative distraction, it could drive the economy to a more competitive structure. So the benefits of fighting climate change is not just to avoid uh, damage in the future, but also drive the economy to a more competitive structure. So this means that the uh, mitigation, the fighting climate change could could, could trend, trend, uh, transfer from the burden sharing to opportunity sharing. Yeah, this is a, uh, our understanding about the um, opportunities here. Uh, so now, now there are uh, more than 130 countries already uh, committed um, uh, 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 carbon neutrality uh, uh, 
about 70% of our frame are developing countries. Yeah. Why so many countries now suddenly, well, uh, suddenly yeah, they, they committed to, to carbon neutrality? I think the reason is, is very realistic. They saw the opportunities. Yeah. You can imagine that uh, even 10 years ago in 2009 in Copenhagen, yeah. Uh, what people think, what countries think, uh, thought that um, the mitigation is a burden, and what countries are negotiating on how to share the burden. Now suddenly they, 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 they were committed to to carbon neutrality. It means that uh, the pollute first uh, clean up plate model is outdated. So a country can uh, can take off in a low carbon in a low carbon way and it's, it's possible for, for growth to be decoupled with the carbon emissions here. So because of the time is, <laughs> is very short, I'm not, I'm not going to go through details. I just used two, two examples to, to show how the opportunity, how, why is this opportunity yeah, yeah. So 10, 10 years ago, yeah. Yeah, ten years ago, the solar and the wind and the uh, smart uh, and smart uh, electric vehicle were very expensive. But uh, over the past uh, uh, ten years, the price uh, dropped uh, you know, dramatically, uh, about ninety percent. Yeah, and uh, what, uh, and. Uh, for China, if you want, if you want to catch up the um, uh, automobile industry, uh, this is almost impossible. Yeah, but if uh, we, but, but for the new uh, uh, electric vehicle, then it is 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 new for 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 China and for uh, the developing countries. So this is it, it provides uh, uh, opportunities for China to. To, to to catch up, yeah. Now China is the biggest producer and um, and the market for the solar and the wind equipments and the uh, also for the electric uh, vehicles, yeah. And it's also the fastest growth market in the world and the producer uh, internationally competitive, yeah. I'm not going to go through details because of the time is running out here. I. I think uh, when we uh, talk about the opportunities, we also need to uh, look at uh, the opportunities in a new concept. Yeah, when uh, we in China we have a new concept that green is gold. When that means that we need to redefine a good knife. Yeah, uh, uh, the traditional growth model is based on the uh, GDP oriented. Uh, GDP, of course, is very uh, important, but uh, many things cannot be bought from 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 market uh, with many. Yeah. So high GDP does not necessarily mean a high well-being. Yeah. So we need to uh, translate from the GDP warranty to the well-being in warranted. Yeah. Yeah. For the challenges, I I will try to very briefly. Uh, yeah. So I think uh, there are five major challenges. The yeah, first is the uh, uh, that we propose the uh, carbon neutrality targets, but we still need to establish a self enforcing mechanism. Yeah, because the traditional growth model is uh, a traditional economic mechanism is established in a traditional growth, um, growth area. Yeah, so we need to, we, we cannot simply uh, uh, put a, a goal and uh, uh, expect it to be. Uh, is realized that we must uh, establish a self-enforcing mechanism. The second uh, uh, challenge is that China is in a high growth process here. Uh, China's GDP will, will get doubled um, in next uh, 15 years. So it's riding a bicycle. Yeah, you, you need to 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 uh, balance. You need to go go for the keep keep going. So this is very hard. Yeah. Third is the energy transition. Yeah. China is heavily relies on fossil fuel, and uh, but now China has the uh, rapid growth in new energy, but the supply gap is, is there very huge. So this is why China needs to to still needs to uh, to to uh, construct some coal fire. Yeah. So uh, the the challenge four is uh, China is a uh, is a world workshop. The manufacturing is a manufacturing powerhouse. It counts for uh, twenty seven percent of the, the in the GDP. Yeah. 
So this is very hard because yeah? you know the manufacturing is is very energy energy intensive. Yeah. So last uh, challenge, major challenges I think is the transition justice. Yeah. We think that uh, the green transition is a uh, opportunity in general for China, but for some particular sectors, regions, and groups, it will be uh, negatively impacted. So how to help them? Uh, how to achieve the transition and justice. This is a very uh, big challenge, yeah. For how to achieve the green transition, yeah, I think, yeah, uh, very briefly. First, the, the first is the, the green transition is not just an issue of new energy and the new technology, but a holistic paradigm shift, yeah. Uh, China, China is, uh, it, it, we, we propose that, uh, you, you know, uh, over the last uh, 100 years, China has been uh, learning from the Western countries. We think that uh, the model is the, our, our target for modernization. So our efforts is, has been focused on how to achieve the, the modernization like this, but now without uh, much thinking on the content of the modernization. Now the traditional modernization model has a big problem because it's not um, it's not sustainable. So the modernization cannot be scaled up. It's, um, it, it, I, I call it the modernization paradox. So now China is to redefine the modernization with the Chinese style. Um, so, so, so this is very new for, for all countries, including the developed, developed and developing countries. Yeah. Uh, the second is the development strategy. As I mentioned, we need to transit from the GDP wanted to well being wanted. And the third is we need to reshape the economy in the perspective of eco civilization, including the manufacturing services. Uh, Agricultural infrastructure, building, energy transport, uh, um, regional economy, everything needs to be re reshaped uh, uh, in in a process of green uh, transition. There, last is the roadmap of carbon neutrality in China. We propose that we 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 have the one plus n policy in China. One means is a is a general overall guidance that then it means uh, specific uh, uh, sectors. So China is very uh, is firmly committed, adhere to its commitment here. Yeah. So I'm not going to uh, yeah, go through the details. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very informative and deep insight into the subject. And um, if anybody has any comment uh, on the topic of carbon neutrality in China, please do not hesitate to share with us via the chat room. And um, I don't want to waste the time. So our next speaker is Mr. Husar Andras, who is going to speak about the process of uh, implementing carbon neutrality targets. Andras, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Zofi. Um, I will try to stick to the time. Um, just a second, I will start my slides. Can you see them? Yes, we can see. Okay, so I will start, uh, or I will talk about basically the issue where the last speaker ended. I mean, what are the challenges uh, behind uh, the achievement of climate neutrality because we have heard a lot about uh, the importance of the goal etc but uh, we tend to speak a little bit less on on the way forward on, and on the on the huge challenges that that we will face uh, so um I, I listened to the presentations before, not all of them, but I'm not sure if uh, you talked about this before. So what is basically climate neutrality and where does it come from? Um, the first um, legally binding document that contained the concept of climate neutrality was basically the Paris Agreement, which we are all aware of. So uh, the Paris Agreement declared basically that the let's say the end goal of international climate neutrality uh, 
is to achieve this balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases in the second half of this century. Um, however, um, I wanted to mention briefly that more and more people started to talk about that climate neutrality will not be enough as the end goal of our activities. We rather have to strive to achieve climate positivity rather than neutrality, which means that the world globally needs to become a net sink. So we need to, uh, you know, uh, emit less than we can actually absorb uh, of the greenhouse gases. But that's another topic. I just wanted to mention briefly that climate, the concept of climate neutrality is a very important concept but probably not the, not the end stop uh, where, where, we, where we can be all happy uh, in the future. So as you can see, the, the Paris Agreement only declared that we need to achieve this balance in the second half of this century, which basically left a huge room for maneuver uh, and huge uh, level of uncertainty because you know, uh, between 2050 and 2100, you can say that it's the second half of the century. So the UNFCCC requested the IPCC to provide a report on the differences between a 1.5 and a 2 degree world, which is also a goal of the Paris Agreement to keep uh, the global temperature rise well below these two uh, targets. And in that report, basically, uh, they indicated that if we want to keep the temperature rise below 1.5 degrees, we need to be we need to become climate neutrality around 2050 and that is where uh, the commitments are coming from and uh, the last speaker mentioned the a much higher number that i found uh, uh, in terms of the number of countries who have already provided net zero commitments uh, maybe the difference is that in this uh, list which i found um, is uh, compiled on the basis of uh, either a legal commitment or a commitment in a policy document. So maybe not all countries have already provided these kind of types of commitments. And I know, for instance, that China um, announced, as it was mentioned before, only announced this uh, goal uh, at, the, at the UN uh, General Assembly, uh, if I recall well. So anyway, uh, we definitely see a growing number of net zero commitments, which is great, uh, of course, um, including the European Union and including Hungary, uh, because Hungary uh, set climate neutrality by, by 2050 as a national target as well. Uh, it's not true for every single EU member state so far, but we have adopted a climate law in 2020 and our long-term strategy that basically underpins uh, this target had, has been uploaded to the UNFCCC website as well. There are not too much uh, um, uh, LTSs uploaded uh, on the UNFCCC website, which is, which is a pity because uh, it was requested by the Paris Agreement and the decision that adopted the Paris Agreement that they should be done uh, by the end of 2020. And uh, the last time I, I saw it was somewhere around 30 countries who have already uploaded uh, long-term strategies, which is basically, you know, uh, it's not enough to have this goal, but you need to underpin it with concrete uh, plans and, and uh, pathways, et cetera. So this is one very first challenge of the implementation after you have declared your goal to underpin it with some concrete ideas how you would like to achieve it. Um, so I've provided some figures uh, on this slide, on these two slides, uh, this one and the next one, how huge is the challenge? So you can see the GHG emission pathway of Hungary so far. So we peaked uh, sometime in the, in the early uh, 1980s. And since then, uh, our emissions are uh, more or less continuously falling. And there were some uh, um, uh, increase in uh, lately after the, the global uh, economic crisis in the recovery uh, period. 
but since 1990, our emissions uh, were low, uh, are lower uh, by around 33%, uh, which means that if we want to achieve the balance between emissions and sinks, roughly we need to achieve a 95% emission reduction compared to 1990. So if you think about it, we are in, in terms of time, we are halfway between 1990 and 2050 now. Um, and so far, we only completed one third of the emission reduction and two thirds uh, is left for the next 30 years. Uh, but unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know, uh, it depends on how you see it, other countries have not even started to decrease their emissions. And I wanted to put the, the figures of China uh, here. Um, we see a, a huge amount of increasement in the past uh, 20 years or so. And uh, there was a drawback uh, lately, but uh, the emissions are, are keep on uh, rising. And uh, China is uh, only facing with the challenge to, to peak the emissions and start to decrease them. So, but this is true for, for many other uh, developing uh, countries and developed countries as well. So for instance, um, our neighbor Austria have not been able to decrease one uh, gram of uh, GHG emissions since 1990, for instance. So this is another uh, interesting uh, fact. So we, when we talk about climate neutrality, we should not only look to the future, but we have to look back to the past, like, you know, uh, where are we now and how we ended up here? And we can see how big is the, is the challenge um, we, that lies ahead. This figure is from the Hungarian long-term strategy, which I had the opportunity to work in. And this shows uh, two uh, scenarios, basically, the, the so-called early action and the so-called late action scenario. The early action is with the green and the late action is with the, the orange uh, pathway. But um, to be honest, I don't think that the uh, emission reduction will be that linear. I just put it up this slide because you can see how swift the decrease should be in order to achieve climate neutrality. And so far, we, we don't know how really to achieve this kind of uh, decreasement during normal economic periods because obviously when we face when we are facing with crises like the economic crisis or the COVID-19 crisis these are not the kind of situations which we would like to see in the in the next 30 years uh, in terms of greenhouse gas emission reduction you know we want to strive we want to uh, keep uh, the economies in, in relatively good shape, but still we need to achieve these kind of emission reductions, which is a huge challenge uh, in itself. Um, briefly, I, I wanted to mention here four key aspects, which I believe are crucial uh, to the implementation of the climate neutrality goal. So first of all, I think you need to have a political will and support from the society because I think that the two are interlinked. So, you know, if the society supports this goal, then the politicians will be much more um, enthusiastic about it. And vice versa, if the, if the society is not that uh, keen to achieve this transition, then the political will, will, will uh, reduce for sure. And it's a, it's a big challenge in itself to keep that political will because as long as we are talking about the, the targets, which are 30 years ahead, it's fine. But you know, if we, if we introduce concrete measures like we saw with the uh, re, uh, increasement of the fuel price in France, uh, there was a Yellow West movement. So huge protests were against this, uh, this measure which was not necessarily the best measure, but it was one concrete measure which harmed the society's interests, at least in the, in the short term. So, you know, politicians needs to, needs to balance uh, um, uh, between, between those kind of uh, interests and uh, requests by the society. And we, we are currently have 
facing with an energy price crisis, basically, uh, especially in the within the European Union, energy prices are going up. And it's a huge challenge uh, because uh, some politicians have started to argue that we need to throw away the climate goals. We need to decrease uh, the energy prices because society cannot bear this kind of uh, you know, burden. So this is a huge challenge in itself. The second one I mentioned here is that uh, basically the transition needs to be an iterative process. So we need to see, we need to go back all the time what we have planned, whether uh, if, it's, if it's pointing to the right direction and whether the actual implementation, you know, um, um, is the way that we would like to go forward or are there any experience that we need to need to uh, build in uh, to our policies etc so my key uh, argument here is that not the plan uh, that we set up is the most important but the processes that we set, that we have set up so continuously we need to go back and see whether uh, the, uh, the plans we, we set are adequate enough, are going into the right direction, etc. And we need to have permanent processes in place in order to do that. Thirdly, proper institutions are also key uh, with the proper competences because we can have the best in institutions in place if they don't have the proper competences. Uh, then uh, they will not achieve uh, the goals that we would like them to achieve. Of course, it's it's much more complex than that because uh, a lot more depends on the political will, I believe. So institutions in themselves are still not enough, but all these you know um, aspects I mentioned here needs to be there in one place at the same time in order to achieve the goals. And last but not least, I also believe that the science and policy cooperation is crucial uh, because climate policy needs to be science-based. Um, uh, you know, climate change uh, uh, can be written as a scientific problem and the solutions can be scientifically underpinned as well. And I believe that uh, the, the decision makers needs to go uh, and ask scientists what are the best uh, options, etc. Of course, the the responsibility of the decisions lies uh, at the political uh, decision makers but uh, these policies are much more um, adequate, I believe, if they are underpinned by scientific uh, knowledge. And in my last slide, I wanted to mention the case of Hungary vis-a-vis uh, -vis these uh, aspects, key aspects of implementation from the long-term strategy of Hungary. So in terms of the political will and support from the society, I believe that uh, we are almost there. Uh, as I mentioned, we have adopted the climate law, so it's in place, it's a legally binding document and achievement. And uh, when you when you read about um, uh, researches, uh, opinion polls by the society, you, you often found that 80 plus percent of the society backs these kind of uh, goals, uh, you can find uh, uh, even higher numbers sometimes, but challenge is still relevant. And what I mean by that is that uh, when it comes to concrete decision-making and concrete uh, policies and measures, it's not always like that nice picture that everybody backs those kind of uh, policies. And unfortunately, what I see is that as time goes by and we are in a worse situation uh, in terms of uh, the danger of climate change, the more sewer um, you know, and uh, stricter measures are needed, which are less likely to be supported by the society. So it's, um, it's a vicious circle, unfortunately, what I see sometimes. Um, coming uh, to the processes, um, the Hungarian long-term strategy established specific consultation forms composing of uh, the representatives of the government, the state, and companies and other uh, stakeholders. So they are in place. We have yet to see whether they will work properly, but, but at least they are, they are there in the, in the long-term strategy. Uh, the long-term strategy also established the Green Financial Working Group, which I believe is a crucial cross-cutting uh, forum 
you know everything uh, is backed by needs to be uh, backed by by money by resources and the, the green financial working group task is to find out how these kind of activities will be financed there are also county level climate platforms and government operated online platforms where basically everybody can uh, have an opinion and can upload their opinion and uh, uh, pro uh, proposals or any any observation uh, to the government directly in terms of uh, the climate neutrality uh, target and its implementation. Thirdly, uh, uh, in terms of the institutions, I believe that environmental ministries are not enough anymore because they treat these kind of things as um, as a specific uh, area as a special you know, uh, theme, but I believe that climate change is that cross-cutting that basically you need to have a horizontal coordination and you need to have an institution which basically governs or, or, um, or um, look after all the activities of all the, all the ministries. So basically I would argue that uh, we need to have a, a, a coordination uh, between ministries in terms of uh, uh, the green transition. And the, the Hungarian long-term strategy created the so-called interministerial committee on climate change, which basically it is what, what the name says. So basically all ministries needs to come together and uh, plan their uh, climate related activities um, by exchanging views uh, with each other. So not to treat this issue in a silo, in an environment ministry, but coordinate between ministries. That's, that's the key, key message. And last but not least, the Hungarian LTS refers to a national climate change assessment report. So we, we initiated a process in Hungary, which basically is the national translation of the IPCC report. So we are planning to compile together Hungarian, specifically Hungarian uh, national climate change assessment report, which can serve as a good uh, material for political decision making. And I will stop here and I thank you for the attention and looking forward to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. You provide the very uh, thought provoking outlook on the background of challenges and on the possible future of carbon neutrality. And uh, now we have to move on to the next speaker, who is uh, Mr. Um, Zhang Jianyu, who will hold his presentation with the title of China ETS uh, Updates and Next Steps. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, great. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Apologize, uh, I was uh, dragged out for a different immediate task that uh, I was not able to uh, present in my office. So I have to just speak like this, although I have prepared a presentation, but I'll be happy to share that at a later time of my uh, PPT. Uh, my, uh, and, and I'm very glad to hear the previous uh, speakers with regard to the commitments and actions both in China and also uh, in uh, European countries. And uh, my presentation will focus uh, on three topics that I'll try to be concise and I'll be happy to uh, answer questions. Uh, the first one is uh, market mechanisms uh, with the acronym MBI, market-based instruments, were uh, firmly embraced by the Chinese government as a way to uh, 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 to speed up the mitigation measures so as for China to achieve the uh, the two goals that you have been hearing uh, 2030 peaking and also 2060 neutrality. Second uh, point is uh, this embracement the China's upholding of market-based instruments i.e uh, the carbon market ETS has really come a long way uh, to its uh, fruitation as what we are seeing here today. And I'll go over that process briefly. And my third point is, even though if you look at the performance of China's national market is, uh, is, is so-so, uh, but I would argue that performance uh, 
uh, is, uh, is, is normal and uh, uh, there are really rooms uh, to uh, grow that. So if you can bear with me, those will be my three uh, points. Let me uh, touch on the first one. Uh, surprise, surprise, uh, you know, it's hard for people to outside China to really understand why a communist country like China uh, had this uh, strong desire and aspiration to embrace the market as a way to help with its uh, environmental goals, in particular, the uh, carbon goals. But if I told you that this is actually something not so surprise, surprising uh, within China, because China has come a long way. Even go back to the uh, 1980s, when China literally just started its environmental movement, uh, market has been uh, identified as one of the key measures that can help to achieve this goal. I vividly remember uh, in the uh, early 90s that uh, China sent delegations to uh, surprisingly, former Eastern, Eastern European countries like Poland and trying to learn the practice of a pollution levy system, which then later on was adopted in China and later was converted to uh, our environmental tax system as uh, what it is right, right now. And uh, fast forwarding, uh, China then uh, explored the application of uh, uh, MBIs in the dealing with acid rain problems back to uh, the uh, uh, early uh, uh, 2000 that uh, that uh, that was also in the honeymoon uh, in the in China and United States in terms of environmental collaboration. Uh, yeah. Uh, the car software market was established and used was used as a model to advocate for the uh, uh, for the ETS, uh, JI, and also CDM uh, in the 1997 Kyoto uh, Protocol negotiation. And then, uh, you know, after Copenhagen, uh, China getting firm uh, after a long practice of the CDM, the clean development mechanisms, that China announced the plan to. Uh, start uh, doing carbon trading pilots. There were totally seven of them domestically uh, to pilot the idea of uh, a carbon market. And then there was the announcement back to 2015 that uh, uh, in the joint uh, China-US uh, presidential statement that China will launch the uh, market, uh, carbon national carbon market uh, you know, by 2017. Uh, and, uh, you know, Amazingly, uh, you know, with all the hurdles and challenges uh, that I will lay out uh, shortly, that uh, the market was launched uh, on July the 16th, 2020, and uh, immediately it became the uh, largest carbon market in the world uh, just by its, uh, its sheer size. Uh, and I think if you uh, deep into that, uh, that I, I think we have to uh, appreciate that throughout the openness policy uh, of China, starting from the early 1980s, uh, you know, the government really aspired uh, of the force of the market, but also really trying to address the issue of efficiency, uh, not in the just efficiency of uh, manufacturing production and energy efficiency, but also the efficiency in its environmental endeavor. And uh, the market has been identified as a main uh, instrument to uh, help uh, reduce the cost of uh, environmental mitigation, uh, but also as a way to uh, mobilize and motivate uh, all different stakeholders within the society to contribute to this very nascent uh, movement on environmental uh, management. So, uh, uh, and also this thing was further uh, cemented back to uh, 2018 when the third session of the Communist Party's 18th uh, plenary session, uh, the, statement, the, the, uh, the statement was issued and uh, uh, there was one very firm confirmation there saying that uh, we'll use the market 
uh, to figure out, to find out the best way of the allocation of resource uh, in the society, which includes environmental resources. And also, uh, if we move further, uh, when China declared that in the field of climate change in its 19 party Congress, that China will not only want to be a contributor, a participant, but also a torch barrier uh, in global climate movement, which is being represented with all the things you are hearing right now. Uh, we actually believe that the carbon market is one of the approach that the Chinese government is, uphold, is upholding to fill its, uh, its aspiration that it wants to become a torch barrier in terms of climate uh, management in the world. So, uh, and I'm very happy to uh, share with you if you not if you have not seen uh, two of the most important uh, documents slash guideline uh, document were released uh, one on Sunday one uh, you know literally uh, uh, just about an hour ago which was uh, named as the uh, guideline for China's uh, peaking on carbon neutrality uh, endeavor. And the document that was released just about an hour ago uh, is the pathway of uh, 2030 peaking. And I believe uh, both documents were available on the internet right now. And uh, there were English translation of them. Uh, you're welcome to take a look. Uh, but I believe those two documents uh, will really help to demonstrate and cement China's position entering into the Glasgow negotiation, which is uh, you know, in, the, in the coming days. And uh, uh, I think those two uh, key documents really represent the essence of the, uh, the China's NDC, as well as China's uh, mid-century uh, strategy. So that was my uh, first point. Uh, the, oh, sorry, uh, you have one more point. Uh, in these two key documents that Again, uh, the use of the carbon market was uh, even further strengthened uh, in, the, in these two uh, key documents. Uh, and also, it also emphasized on um, the ex expansion of the existing carbon market to more sectors, to introduce more uh, policy uh, in in instruments, and also to borrow more power from the more popular uh, green finance practices so as all contribute uh, to the uh, uh, to the development of the carbon market itself. So put a price on carbon is no longer a uh, uh, philosophical discussion in China. It actually has already been put into practice as what it is today. So that was my uh, first point. My second point is uh, China's endeavor for building a national carbon market really have come out a long way. I, uh, briefly mentioned about the uh, the ten uh, sorry the seven carbon trading pilots uh, which includes four direct city uh, which is a provincial level political entity Beijing Tianjin Shanghai and Chongqing two provinces Guangdong and uh, Hubei and also the special city of Shenzhen it was uh, coded as six plus one uh, because of the special status that Shenzhen has which launched the first ever national carbon trading pilot market back to June the 18th of, uh, of 2013. Well, my point of, uh, uh, is, has come a long way, not only because of the time, uh, because NDRC, then the National Development Planning Commission issued the first notice to start the carbon trading pilots back to 2011, exactly 10 years ago. But also thinking about you know, all the changes that happened in the world, uh, the 2015 Paris Agreement, Trump's uh, withdrawal from the Paris, Biden's re-enter of the uh, of the Paris, the COVID, uh, and uh, you know all of the other uh, disturbance uh, in the world. Certainly not just on carbon management, but also on all the global affairs. But quite amazingly, Chinese government was able to uphold its commitment of launching this national climate market. So. Uh, and, and despite uh, not only the international interactions, uh, but also uh, the domestic changes, uh, one of which, which is most significant 
is the what we call the institutional reform the change of the uh, the authority of the climate management from NDRC, the National Development Commission, to MEE, the Ministry of Ecology and Environment, uh, back to uh, June of uh, 2018. And certainly there was then there was the COVID, uh, you know, which hit hit everybody very hard. Uh, you know, China was not exempt. Uh, but again, I want to emphasize, even this, despite all of those challenges, changes in personnel and the global uh, economic situation, China was able to, uh, to fulfill its commitment, uh, launch the preparation of the carbon macro card on December the 19th, uh, 2017, and eventually put that into operation uh, on July the 16th, uh, 2021, uh, this year. So uh, it's, I was very lucky uh, to be uh, with the process uh, through its entire uh, entirety, and uh, uh, and I was literally present for both the uh, the launch back to 2017 and also the operational ceremony on 2021. I have to say it was really a very touchy moment uh, if you think about the long journey that we have come uh, to uh, what it is today. Uh, certainly, is on the uh, uh, the performance of the of the market. Uh, to start with, uh, for those of you who may not uh, watch this closely, the initial uh, market only covers the power sector. Uh, it uh, covers 2,162 entities and uh, it encompasses about 4.5 billion tons of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, it caps uh, about 40% of China's total carbon emission uh, and that's equivalent to about 12.5% of the uh, global uh, emission. And uh, uh, so far, uh, as I said earlier, the performance is measured. Uh, our average trading uh, price is uh, quite uh, stable at about uh, a little bit more than 40 RMB uh, per ton, which is equivalent to about uh, uh, a little bit $6. And the uh, uh, the trading uh, volume volume uh, that varies from you know uh, day to day as low as uh, in the uh, uh, volume of less than uh, 100 tons per day to as high as uh, about a, uh, a million tons. Uh, and uh, I think that's understandable because I think all of you have seen the up and downs of the EU carbon market. Uh, including the phase one, uh, and, uh, uh, and and actually, if you compare with uh, what the uh, the EU market is today with China, uh, even though the EU market has you know millions of tons of uh, trading volume on a daily basis and uh, very satisfactory liquidity, uh, but the importance is that it has you know three. If you go uh, down to the details, it has three kind of trading activity: the derivatives, the futures the auction and the spot trading. And the China market right now only has the spot trading. And that's one of the reasons that why liquidity has been a big challenge. Uh, but what I can share with you is that major efforts are underway trying to uh, 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 improve the liquidity through the introduction of uh, more uh, uh, instruments, uh, including the futures, uh, including auctions, including consignment. Uh, to the Chinese market, uh, as well as uh, to uh, the expansion and the inclusion of other sectors, so as to introduce, uh, you know, a differentiation of marginal reduction costs to stimulate uh, trading activities and uh, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, well, I want to uh, touch on two uh, very uh, important aspects of the Chinese carbon market development, uh, which I may not have the full answers. Actually, I will want to revert that back to the experts here uh, if we have time for discussion. One is the thing about uh, CBAM, the carbon border adjustment mechanisms that uh, EU has uh, started. Uh, well, surprise, surprise, you know, uh, with all of you international uh, observers, you know, US uh, is going to come pretty much empty handed uh, to Glasgow because CEP, the Clean Power uh, Plan, uh, will not be included in the interest, neither the infrastructure bill nor the reconciliation bill. So uh, EU and China will be 
uh, literally the two largest entity uh, that has an established uh, carbon market. And uh, I think the the key of the future development of the global carbon market will be in the way how EU and China can collaborate uh, with regard to market activities. Well, here I want to uh, recognize EU for its contribution to uh, China's carbon market establishment uh, for more than a decade of effort, many delegations uh, to the EU, to Brussels, uh, to talk with the Germans, uh, you know, to talk with people, Swedish, uh, you know, all the other countries learning the EU experience uh, that all have contributed to the build up. But I have to say this introduction of the CBAM uh, is a little bit uh, perplexing. And it's controversial uh, because, uh, uh, from a China perspective, that uh, you know the uh, market itself it should be the way to help to introduce the efficiency and further reduction of the carbon reduction, and should not be uh, used as a trade policy, so to speak, to uh, uh, to stimulate uh, you know the uh, potential controversies. But certainly, uh, I think China is. Uh, a, a strong believer and supporter of the expansion of the carbon market. Uh, that's what I want to bring. The second point is the BRI, the institute I'm working with, that we have conducted a study using the World Bank modeling, assessing the capabilities of the BRI countries and put them into different categories. I'll be happy to share the report uh, that uh, different countries at the different uh, stage of the development. Uh, but you know, some of the uh, BRI countries uh, are uh, very actively trying to uh, embrace the force of the market and to establish their own uh, in the context of the uh, global activities. So uh, I don't, again, I, I can't say I have the answer uh, because uh, on one side, the, we want to see the expansion of the market. We want to see the collaboration of global ETS. We want to see further uh, cooperation with the goal, there's a potentially a global carbon market, so we can have the best representation of the, of the price on carbon, so as to advance uh, global further carbon mitigation. But on the other side, uh, if this market is going to be used as a, a trade policy rather than just for the environment itself, it certainly will have the challenge of being compliance with other trade agreement, i.e., the WTO rules, but also has the potential, the infringement into uh, the sovereign anti sovereignty of individual countries, not to mention about the fundamental principle of the global climate cooperation, which is common but differentiated responsibilities. So I will uh, leave that uh, to the floor uh, for open discussions, and I'll be happy to, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Zhang, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, for this seminar and, um, and for holding this very comprehensive lecture. And last but not least, uh, let me introduce our last uh, speaker of today, Mr. Lee Kersian, who will talk about um, green finance development in China. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. Very pleased and honored to, to be invited to attend the forum where we can change valuable opinion on this globally topic of green finance. Uh, and the U United Nations General Assembly in September 2020, President Xi Jinping announced that China will aim to have carbon emission peak before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. So since then, vigorous policies have been rolled out on top of already hefty input in green development. In 2060, the PBOC, which is the Chinese central bank, published the guidelines for establishing a green financial system. Guided by this overarching design, China has established the green finance policy framework and the development of a wide range of green finance products. As of the end of last year, outstanding green lending in China exceeded 1.8 trillion US dollar, ranking the first globally, while the issued green bonds totally 160 
billion US dollar, ranking the second largest in the world. This has been supported by falling effort. First, China has been improving the policy framework for green finance. The PBOC is in the process of updating the green bonds project guidelines. The new version is expected to remove projects related to fossil fuel production and consumption, include more climate friendly activities. Second, China has begun to focus on dealing with the impact of climate change on monetary policy and financial stability, introducing more ESG factors into investment and promoting the disclosure of environmental information in various countries. Third, China is a strong advocate for international cooperation on green finance. We have supported global cli uh, climate governance, such as G20, NGFS, and IPSF. So for Bank of China as the most internationalized commercial bank in China, BOC is a major contributor of green financing in China. We have integrated environmental protection into our bank policies and actively promoted green financial services. By adopting various measures, we have to reduce the environmental impact of our operations and protect the natural environment. First, as of the end of June this year, the domestic green loan balance is exceeded exceeded 150 billion US dollar, an increase of 15% compared to the end of last year, a much faster pace in overall loan portfolio of Bank of China. So BOC is also a leading issuer and underwriter of green bonds. Second, BOC will provide at least, will provide at least 155 billion US dollars of funds for the green industry during the next five years. Meanwhile, starting, uh, I should emphasize that, meanwhile, starting from the first quarter of this year, Bank of China will no longer provide financing for new coal mines or coal fire power stations overseas. So third, Bank of China has supported a number of economic a green, uh, iconic green, green projects such as the world's largest solar power station in Abu Dhabi. In August 2021, 20, Bank of China won the, for the, best sustainable, uh, the best sustainable finance bank award, the, the outstanding leading leadership in blue bonds award by Global Finance Magazine. Bank of China CEE also provides a strong support for green finance in the Central and Eastern Europe region. We supported the Kapuswar solar power station, which is the largest solar power plant in Hungary. In the next step, Bank of China CEE will continue to deepen innovation in green financial services for this region. So finally, I, I would say there is only one earth, only by relying on the joint efforts of every participant in every industry, can our future generations have a healthier and a sustainable living environment. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lee. And uh, thank you all for these uh, fascinating uh, presentations and lectures. And uh, now we have a few minutes for a very quick Q&A session. So, um, so let's see. Um, we have a question from... Uh, Cecilia to Andres, uh, 
it sounds, uh, in your opinion, the current instability in energy prices may accelerate the green transition, or is it in favor of those parliamentarians who are against the ambitious goals of the Green Deal? Andras? Uh, thank you for the question. It's definitely not easy. There's a very um, exciting political discussion uh, currently in, pl in place. Uh, I'm about to publish an article about this question. Um, I'm, I'm really hopeful that uh, we will have uh, good lessons learned from this uh, situation and we will not lose sight of our strategic goals. But at the same time, we need to align uh, the plans to address better these kind of challenges. And what I mean by that? I mean that, uh, you know, those who are in need should be supported, especially uh, for the higher energy bills, definitely. But I believe this support should be differentiated and not necessarily differentiated between member states, but I believe that we also have to differentiate within member states because I don't think that uh, you know the highest uh, ten percent or fifty percent of the society would need any kind of support for higher energy bills, but uh, the poorest definitely need that support. So the transition needs to be just. That's a guiding principle that should be in place definitely. But we need to also introduce price signals which makes energy efficiency investments, renewable energy investments much more affordable and much more you know, profitable and much more and makes much more sense. Because otherwise, if there's no price advantage in these kind of investments, that makes them much more difficult to, to be introduced. So I'm really hopeful that we, we learn the good lessons from this situation and uh, it will help us to achieve a more just, but definitely needed transition. Thank you, Andres. And uh, if there's no any other question, then uh, I would have one to Mr. Um, Zhang Yongsheng. Um, is there a real social support for uh, climate neutrality in China? I mean, uh, do every Chinese people care about climate, climate neutrality? Yes. Yeah, Thank you. This is very interesting and a very important question. Yeah, um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we conducted a uh, web-based survey. It shows that uh, uh, most of the people think that uh, um, uh, the awareness uh, mindset changes uh, substantially. Yeah? most of uh, most of the people think that uh, the environment and the economic growth is not conflicting and. Uh, 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 only uh, about, uh, about ten percent or something. I can't remember exactly. Yeah, I think that um, environmental protection is conflicting with the economic growth. Yeah, if if uh, they make choice, and then only uh, less than four percent of people uh, will choose the. Um, uh, 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 income increase rapidly, but the uh, environmental get worse uh, uh, obviously. So this is very uh, substantial uh, transition in China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all the comments on uh, the topics of the panel discussion. Uh, also from Andras and uh, Mr. Um, Zhang Jianyu. We can uh, see them in the chat room. But uh, I think that uh, our time uh, is over and that this is the end of, second, that's the end of the second panel discussion. Thank you very much uh, for the attention and thank you uh, uh, very much for accepting the invitation for this uh, seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I will say a few uh, concluding remarks. Uh, on behalf of the Ontology of Knowledge Center, it was a great honor to organize, to co-organize with the China CE Institute 
this excellent seminar. Um, I hope to welcome uh, our Chinese speakers in Budapest in, in real life in the future. Um, um, and really, I, I'm not going to, um, to, of course, wrap up a three hour long seminar, but I would really like to point out a few issues that I think really worthwhile to have a, a future look when we come to EU-China cooperation on, on green transition um, and renewable energy. I would really recommend to, to conduct uh, in-depth research in the future also on uh, China's leadership position in this field and how it can uh, be aligned with the EU's um, promised or self-envisioned uh, uh, leadership position, because that's going to be a very important question going forward. I think it's very important to learn from the Chinese example of aligning nuclear energy and renewables. And here in Europe, we can learn a lot from that uh, experience. Um, and also, I think that one of the key takeaways is that we are thinking about how to become climate natural until 2050 or 2060, and even beyond that, becoming climate um, negative, um, but um, or, or climate positive. But um, but really, must see that we have to align these plans, and and no country, no uh, political uh, um, institution is going to uh, do it alone. We must cooperate uh, on these issues in in, in climate uh, negotiations. And as, a, as one of the speakers pointed out, that we are talking about creative destru destruction and realigning our economic structures, political structures into a green way of life. And let's use this opportunity um, to create more uh, uh, benefits in the future and not um, to, um, to enhance competition, but to uh, enhance cooperation uh, between China and EU and the whole globe, because this is a if there is one global issue, green transition is a global issue and something benefiting all mankind. So I would like to thank you very much uh, for this excellent seminar. And uh, a lot of topics were discussed and many uh, um, uh, will be uh, researched in the future. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye.